This is based on a large urban district in Texas. Um, we followed students, these are 2010 graduates from this particular district, and we followed them through the pipeline. 82% said they planned to go to college, so pretty much everyone plans to go to college who graduates in this district. Um, but among those who said, and this was, um, we asked students, do you plan to attend college next fall? And this was taken immediately before graduation, the week before graduation. So we had 82% of students telling us, yes, I'm going to college next fall. Um, but only 56% of them had actually applied to a college. <laughs> so, you know, there's a big mismatch there. And there's a lot of students who are kind of dropping out of the process at that particular point in time. Most of the students who did apply had been accepted somewhere, um, in many cases because they applied to a community college where um, they had pretty much open enrollment policies. But then again, we saw a big drop in students who had, you know, planned to attend college, applied, been accepted, one foot in the door, and then for whatever reason didn't make it to college in the fall. Um, so some of the college access programs that I've been working on really focus on working with the students in between high school graduation, that summer between high school graduation and college, when they really don't have anyone looking out for them. You know, they're, they're counselors from high school, no longer on duty, the college counselors haven't quite picked them up yet, and so it's really kind of this missing period, and it's referred to in the research as summer melt, is this phenomenon of <coughs> students dropping off and disappearing out of the pipeline at that point. And then as you follow them into persisting into the second year, you know, increasingly students begin to drop out more. And then, you know, if we followed this on through graduation, um, we'd probably be down somewhere near 10% of graduates from this particular district who actually made it all the way through the college pipeline. Um, you know, this is a large urban district, a particularly low performing district um, with regard to college enrollment. So the green line above it presents, I tried to use the um, NCES data to kind of give a national picture of what this looks like. But you still see that there's a downward slope. Students are dropping out at each point in the process. And we, we drew similar graphs in Boston, in Atlanta, in Albuquerque, and in every place that we've looked, you see the same kind of you know, trajectory where students are dropping out. It's not that it's flat and everyone's making it through to one point and then dropping out. They're dropping out at each stage of the process. So I think that, you know, this really teaches us that we need to be keeping, you know, paying attention to students and making sure that we have interventions in place at each point in the stage to make sure that we're not letting students leak out of the system in this way. And I think, you know, there are a number of things that can be done. Part of it is focusing on times of greatest risk and students at the margins. Um, you know, also identifying areas for improvement. So if I went back to that large urban district in Texas, I would tell them you really need to focus on that point in time between the college plans and the application process. And then again, once they've applied and been accepted, you really need to work with them over the summer to make sure that they actually get into school. So looking at the data, figuring out where are problem areas, what do we need to be focusing on? Um, you know, I, using data to determine what works and what doesn't. You know, my experience in working with districts is that particularly these, um, you know, low-income urban districts that have a lot of money and a lot of people who are trying to help them increase their college-going rates. And what's happening is that programs are being piled on top of each other. For counselors who are completely overworked, you know, are dealing with things like class scheduling and discipline and everything else but college going. And, you know, to pile 15 different college going, you know, interventions on top of each other, really kind of, they start to cancel each other out. And none of the programs get the attention that they need. So you need to think very carefully about what programs are working, keep the ones that are working, scale them up, and the ones that aren't working, get rid of them. And um, a lot of this is about equipping school uh, students with the tools and the support that they need for success. You know, we don't need to necessarily convince every student to go to college. Most students actually do want to go to college. So it's really just giving them what they need to, to help them along the way. I think something really important is that we need to facilitate multiple pathways. Um, a lot of the college access and college going interventions really focus on four year college attendance. And um, as Dan was talking about with the career and technical education um, efforts, it's very important th that students are able to understand how they can participate in post secondary education in a variety of ways outside of just attending a four year college. 
And then I think another important thing is ensuring that all stakeholders are working together. You know, these, this is particularly important at those kind of transition points, you know, where students don't really have a home in that summer between high school and college. School districts and colleges need to be working together to bridge those gaps. They also need to make sure that their policies aren't working against each other. Um, you know, I can talk you know, on the side with some of you guys, but there are some interesting things going on in Texas with the placement, developmental education placement policies of community colleges and a lack of understanding about what's going on in the school districts. And this is leading to the misplacement of many students in remedial education. Students are very high performing math students who are then being placed in remedial education. So let's get started. In the beginning, college aspirations. So the majority of students report plans to achieve a four-year degree. Although when you look at the, Alaska, the American Indian and Alaska Native population, it's significantly lower than what you see. So you can see you know, that they're about two-thirds of what the national plans for, um, to achieve a four-year degree are. One bit of caution that I'm going to give about student um, reports of what they plan to do, they're very unreliable. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I was in charge of a senior exit survey in a school district, and it's, I mean, as you saw, 82% of kids told us the week before graduation that they were planning to go to college, and 35% of them showed up. So be very careful about taking this as, okay, these are the kids who are gonna go to college. This is our college enrollment rate, because this probably isn't gonna end up being the college enrollment rate. Okay, so moving on to the enrollment process and the application process now. Um, most students who plan to attend college do take the SATs, although, again, if you look at the American Indian and Alaska Native students, they are somewhat less likely, although they are taking the SATs at relatively high rates. Most students are applying to at least one uh, institution, although, again, you see here that the rates of application are at least about 10 to 15 percentage points lower for Alaska Native American Indian students. So moving on to college choice. So this is you know, just one piece of the college application process. And so why does college choice matter? There's also students really need to be thinking cost versus benefits. You know, when we're doing these college counseling interventions, we talk a lot about what colleges to go to and what are the benefits of these different colleges and very little about what are the costs of these different colleges. I'll, but costs, you know, I'll show you in the next slide, college costs are a key part of the family decision about where to go to college. So the fact that they're not being talked to about, you know, the different costs of colleges and student loans and the different financial considerations that come into play with making college decisions is an issue. So I told you financial considerations play an important role in college choice. Here you can see across the board they're important. Um, for the American Indian and Alaska Native population, it appears that they're somewhat more important for female. The financial considerations are somewhat more important for females than they are for males. <laughs> okay, financial aid. Um, the majority of students who apply to college do apply for financial aid, although if you look at the American Indian and Alaska Native population, Alaska Native males are much less likely to uh, apply for financial aid. So the landscape for college costs and financial aid, we know this looks pretty good in Alaska right now. College costs are relatively low here. The introduction of the um, Alaska Performance Scholarship has been extremely important and is going to be very helpful. And there are relatively few students accumulating large amounts of debt. However, there are a lot of challenges. College costs remain. There are still a lot of barriers in the financial aid process, and a lot of families still lack the financial literacy. So even though they filled out the FAFSA and they see the cost of the colleges, they still don't have the literacy to be able to decide, to know, okay, this is what I'm, you know, should I take out loans? Here's what I'm gonna have to pay for this many years over time. And so interventions that really target the financial literacy of families can play a big role in this. Um, okay, so now finally to enrollment and entry. Um, enrollment rates, this is similar to what Diane was presenting, you know, they differ significantly by race and ethnicity. Although along every racial ethnic group, females are more likely to enroll in college than males. And here you can see that the college enrollment rates for Alaska Natives are about half of what they are nationally. 
The differences are somewhat smaller when you look at immediate enrollment, but the issue here is that Alaska Native students tend to have lower persistence rates. So when you look at their enrollment rates over a longer period of time, you see that they decline. All right, remedial courses. You know, more than a third of enrollees take remedial courses across the nation. However, in Alaska, it's closer to 55 or 60 percent of students who are taking remedial courses. So why do we care about remedial courses? Um, impacts a large number of students, costs the state and colleges a lot of money. There's really a mixed bag of develop uh, placement policies, curricula, support programs. Um, it really varies from college cultures. Not a lot of consistency across colleges and how they do these things, and that's been a real issue. There are concerns about misplacement of students that I mentioned, issues with the quality of courses, and these concerns about students getting stuck in this remedial system and not being able to get out of it. And also the overall evidence on remediation is mixed. There's some evidence that it might increase graduation rates, but other studies show that it has no impact on earnings or employment. So, you know, we really need to be thinking about are these classes helpful in any way to students or should we just be enrolling them directly into college level courses if there is no impact of these courses. And then finally, persistence in graduation. Something that's very important to look at is persistence into the second year of college. That's a very important indicator of potential success. success. And you can also see here that graduation rates are about half for well, a little less, two thirds for Alaska Native students compared to what they are overall. So, um, main point, you know, the, it's a long pathway, many places to drop out, but I'm a glass half full person, and to me, you know, thinking about at each point, if we could just increase the number of students who make it through this process by five or 10 percentage points, it's very low hanging fruit, you know, with these summer intervention programs, all it took, I mean, they had applied, they'd been accepted, they'd already paid, they'd already paid deposits to their college of choice and then weren't showing up. You know, so the, the few little steps, it was $50 per student for us to create these interventions that got them in the door. You know, so thinking about where this low hanging fruit is and really trying to, you know, make differences at each point of the process. And, you know, as I've discussed, there are a number of different things that States can be doing to support this. So thank you very much.